Development Services Director is here. Everybody's here. So if we can't answer your question, if I can't answer your question, we'll get these folks uh, to do that. But before we start, I have to, uh, I have to tell you, uh, first of all, thank you to the aldermen that are here. Tom Butke in District 9. I'm um, glad he here is here. Gordy Earl is here. And there's going to be a, a special uh, council meeting on Tuesday. It uh, will be Gordy's last one. His Loris, uh, and he's been in for 10 years. And um, we'll give him the recognition, certainly, that he deserves that night. But I will tell you what, he's, Gordy has done such a great job. Um, not only does he go to his committee assignments, but he goes to many other committees, and he's just well-informed. And, and we are going to uh, miss him 10 years. And uh, it just so happens that the person that got voted in, Ken Bargander, is here, who will be sworn in uh, next week. So we're happy he is here. Um, and then a special one that got me a little nervous, a former alderman, Ed Wagner, is here. <clears throat> so now I'm really nervous, Ed. I have to tell you, what I always, uh, when I was running, I would come to the meetings and I would watch a lot of them. And uh, I was always impressed. Ed always knew everything on that agenda. There was nobody more prepared uh, than he was. So to have him here tonight is a little overwhelming. <laughs> but that's okay. So tonight the format is, I'm gonna give you a short presentation, maybe 10 to 12 minutes, um, just to give you an update on what has gone on in the last year. And then I'm gonna turn it over to you, to the questions that you have. If I can't answer them or somebody here can't answer them, uh, then we will get back to you. We'll do the same as we did six months ago. Doing everything possible to have as much communication with the citizens as we possibly can. And this is just one of the formats. So um, Tom, you wanna go to that first slide? The, uh, what we're gonna go through here tonight is we're gonna go through a little bit of our um, uh, police and fire service, what we've been able to do there. Uh, we're also gonna get into some communication and uh, we're gonna get into a lot of different things. So we'll start with public safety. When I ran, public safety was a very big deal. Having the public safety there uh, in the city, I believe, is one of the biggest things that local government should give. So uh, we had some issues going on. We had the police radios that were an issue. Uh, we have those updated. At that time, the council at that time was looking to do, uh, to get the radios and to get uh, new radios. And at that time, they were just gonna look at just getting the radios themselves. And as we went on and more investigation went in, then there was, uh, we realized that not only were we going to um, need the radios, but we're, we were gonna need the antennas as well. Can you go to the next one? There we go. So we were able to, instead of dragging this out over five years, the council made a great decision, I believe, to go ahead and lease the radios. And not only did we lease the radios, um, but we also are getting brand new antennas put in I understand we just got an update today um, that they're actually gonna start that process in the next week or so, which is gonna be very good. The reason these radios are so important is because there were times that the, our police officers were out on a call and there were certain areas of the city where they just not, did not get response. That puts everybody at risk. It puts the police officers at risk uh, and it puts um, uh, the public at risk. So we knew we had to do something. Uh, as well as that, we also had our uh, firefighters, and our firefighters were carrying two radios at a time. One radio for UHF, one radio for VHF. And I think when they're in fighting a fire, when it's 1300 degrees in there, they should just have to go get one radio. So we're very proud of the fact that we were able to get that. Uh, also, they got new body cameras, uh, which I think is very helpful. And some great, and this was, um, a, uh, someone from the public donated uh, a device, the uh, Lucas device, to the, um, uh, to the fire department, uh, which is a life-saving device. So we're very happy about that. We're gonna show you a quick video here on the uh, radios. Go ahead, station. Just doing a radio check. You're a tech voice.
these are our new Motorola APX 8000 radios. Um, just purchased these uh, along with the police department. They've got updated radios as well. Um, they are dual band VHF and UHF radios. For tactical situations, fires, hazmat incidents, stuff like that, we would switch to UHF because it gives us better reception. Um, these are probably the most technologically advanced radios we've ever owned down here. Um, basically what happened is, is we went from a two radio system to a one radio system. Again, this contains both UHF and VHF. We used to have to carry around two radios, um, one to operate on fire ground, one to operate with EMS. Um, there is an infrastructure tower system going up, which should be completed in three months or so. Um, that will be a simulcast system, so it will help us with our communications within the city, both fire and police. Um, so, excited for that to happen. So, we're very happy with those new uh, radios, and so far we've gotten some pretty good results. So, we're, and we know once the tower goes in, it will even be better. Um, Chris Jockick from uh, District 3 just showed up, so we're happy that he is here as well. And, much less, uh, Maletta is here. And Maletta and I work together on a cookie ministry. She makes a lot of cookies and I eat them, so I'm really glad that she's here. Um, can you go to the next one there? So I believe the next one is the Senior Center. And the Senior Center is a great, the community center over there on 2nd Street has a lot of different um, uh, activities that take place in there. And one thing that they had, there was a little bit of a frustration with uh, the fact that they didn't have enough handicapped parking uh, out in front. And so we were able to, uh, Dan Connect got involved, Public Works Director, um, Justin Casperson got involved to really get things moving very quickly. And at this center, uh, it works uh, very well. And there are so many different activities for our seniors to actually go through uh, and have so many different things that they could do. Uh, they have meals over there, uh, all kinds of seminars that take place. A lot is there for our seniors, so we're very, very happy um, about that. There's the community center. Um, they have uh, different amenities there, different exercise classes. There's all things that take place there. Let's go to the, the next one. The next is one of the things that I talked about during the um, campaign was more communication on the roads. And uh, it was very interesting coming in, not having any political experience other than uh, some slight political experience, PTA president, and of course, um, getting on Facebook is a big political experience as well. Um, but what was uh, very interesting is I wanted to communicate more because when I was running, there were a lot of people that had issue with our roads because of course we have a couple of potholes and whatnot. This year, Mother Nature, she really took it to us. And so um, we wanted to be able to communicate that better. People thought that they um, promises had been made that certain roads were going to be done, but there was no accountability. So one thing I went through during the campaign is, uh, and then once I was elected, is I met with Dan Connect, And they said, I want to put together a website or a page on our website where we can go and we could take a look, where we could show the citizens a five-year plan of everything that we're going to do so that they could see what actually is taking place. Dan very quickly told me that a five-year plan is too much. There's too many variables, which, if, I mean, the weather this year, I think we're all aware of that. So five years was going to be too much, but he thought three years would be practical. So he and Tom Turchi and David put together this great website you can go to the page, you can go to our page, um, the City of Marshfield page, uh, and then you, can, you will eventually pull up our street improvement plan that will take you to this site right here. And you could go to any one of the different streets. The map will come up and it will show you, for instance, the 2019 overlay projects. It'll show you exactly what's being done. And then if you click on the, that part, then this will actually come up so you could see exactly what street is going to be done, where it's going to be done, the estimated cost, and the project year. And we've got that for three years running. Now, actually, we do it. Um, Dan and Tom have this out for many more years. Um, 
but really three is the max that we could do. This has really helped. Now, this is just the projects that the city is doing. And the city spends about $2 million a year in the projects that we do. Last year, we spent the $2 million plus the 29th Street. I think that was $2.5 million that the state did. I believe you're all aware of Central Avenue was supposed to get done last year. And it, it was actually supposed to get done back in 2015 and 16, delay after delay after delay. They're actually going to start, my understanding is, May 1st. Uh, it's a three to four month project where uh, from Arnold to Harrison Central will be repaired. Now that's an additional, I believe, $2 million along with the two to two and a quarter million plus the $2 million that we're doing. So in Marshfield, we really heard you. When you said we need help with the roads, we heard you and there's a lot of money going into this. And I will tell you, it's, it, you would be surprised how much $100,000 pays for when you're doing a road, not very much. So we are, we are very aware that the roads need to be taken care of and we're doing that um, as best we can. Let's go back to the, you can click back out of that and go back to the next slide there. Uh, and in our, I believe the next one is the communication. We've changed the way we do, uh, do communication. We have, um, in the past, we have subbed it out. We're always happy uh, with, with that, but we felt that number one, we could do a very good job and we could do it cheaper, where we can actually get um, more of a, more communication out to the city. So we did a brand new communication department. Now, as an example, this is something that you don't see in government very often. Last year, in 2018, the amount that was spent was $311,460. Now, about 30,000 of that was for the brand new cameras that you see in here. So the actual amount was about $271,000. This year, in 2019, it was originally budgeted back when they did the budgets for 255,000. This year, with we're combining the systems, where the old way of doing it, having an outside service, ended on April 1st, so we have four months there, and then the new way that we're doing it has taken over since then. So the expected expense this year will be 227 right there. That's a significant savings. But the very big thing is the projection for next year. I believe that it's gonna be right around $200,000, and then we will add another $15,000 a year because I don't believe in the past we've budgeted properly. So what we're gonna be doing on future budgets in our communication is put aside 10 to $15,000 every year so that when a camera breaks down, all these different things break down, we can actually have them repaired. We had a $20,000 piece of equipment that we thought was beyond repair that we actually got repaired. It took a couple of hours and now we don't need to buy that. That's what we need. We need cost savings. So we're very excited about this and we're really hoping that we can reach out in social media platforms, um, a new design on our uh, website. The other thing that you will see is hopefully coming to different locations is a connections flyer. So many people wanna know what's going on in the city, what meetings. Um, we've had meetings in the past where people didn't necessarily know when the meetings were taking place. So you'll be able to get to our homepage and you'll be able to see this and you'll see it at all the different places. Uh, for instance, we're gonna try to get it to Quick Trip, uh, Cedar Rail, Parkview, so that, people, so that people feel connected to the city. Uh, the other thing is our, our cable access channels will now be um, Marshfield channels, MFLD. Uh, in the past, it's been MCTV and starting everything new, we're just gonna have basically Marshfield. So we're very uh, happy about that. A Couple things that we need to do, we need to do a better job of. Number one, we need to do a better job of consistent messaging where people can hear. Number two, we have to start branding where everything in the city has the same logo, no matter where it is. What you see right now is it's kind of hot podge, hodgepodge, there's too many different things. We wanna make sure that we're branding and that is very, very important. So we're very excited with that, with our new uh, communication team. We feel that we're gonna be able to get all these things done. Let's go to the final one. 
The final one is the outreach. Uh, what we know for sure is the most important people that we need to communicate with are the citizens of Marshfield. And we wanna do as much of that as we possibly can. Uh, we are gonna continue to work and build relationships with, Steve and I just met with um, Senator Petrusky, Representative Spiros, and Representative Culp. We met with them about two weeks ago over at the community center. They were going over um, um, Governor Evers' new budget. One of the things in there was, I'm sure you've heard about this or you've read about this, an eight to 10 cent per gallon new gas tax. Eight, now, I think we already pay, I believe, 32 cents. I, I believe that's what it is. So now we're gonna go up a dime. And I told all three of them, you know, why are we being taxed more per gallon? That's a lot, 10 cents more per gallon is a lot. If you want buy-in from that, then give us some of that back now. For instance, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do that, then we heard, the reasons we heard is that we have to um, pay down the debt from prior road issues that, we, that they have done, which is fine. And then somewhere down the road, it will come local. When you hear the term somewhere down the road, that means it's not coming local. And so St Steve and I said to them, how about this? When you collect that 10 cents, Let's help you get the buy-in. You send 20% of that back to the local area. Uh, and our great uh, friends at, at uh, Mackey have been looking into this to see what that actually is. Imagine if they're gonna tax us right away. Just send 20%, do the other 80% to do your road expansion and to pay off your debt and everything else. We're not talking about a couple of bucks here. This would help us here right now. My belief system is if you're gonna if you're gonna tax somebody, you've got to give them an immediate result. Otherwise, it just goes. I was very pleased to see that it it meant um, that it meant something to them. As as you've seen later on, Governor Governor Evers came out and he said um, that they're looking for a way to get that back to the municipalities. Their view right now is ten percent. Here's the key, guys and gals. It's gonna take. It can't just be the city leaders going to these people, the public has to get involved and say, that's our money, give us part of it. So we're very, very happy about that. And I believe um, Representative Spiros is gonna have a um, listening session in the next uh, week or two, so it'd be good to go to that. Uh, I, met, I meet regularly with the Wood County Board Chairman, Doug Mahan, um, and the much younger, it's been pointed out, the much younger mayor of Wisconsin Rapids, Zach Brewing. Um, I think those relationships are crucial to have everybody on the same page and I'm very, very happy with that and with the relationships that we have. One thing that we are establishing uh, in the next week, or, well, I believe it's gonna be at the end of the month is the Common Council is gonna get together with uh, the EDB, Mackey, Main Street, uh, the utility, many of the local businesses in the same room at the same time. We need a consistent vision that everybody is working towards. I think what happens so much is people are working in different directions. Maybe the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. So I'm very, very excited about that. I'm very excited, we're also gonna meet with the, the uh, downtown Marshfield uh, folks and uh, the school board, we have that coming up. I believe that the more communication that we can do, the better off everybody is going to be. Another very exciting thing is uh, possibly develop a housing committee. Uh, we just did a study and the study was very revealing. Um, the study showed that we don't have many properties available here in Marshfield. Now the key thing is, it's supply and demand. And Marshfield is in big demand. How do we know that? Because there are not properties available, which means people wanna stay, and when they are, there's multiple offers on these properties right away. So we really need to do something about housing. And this committee, I believe is gonna be very helpful. The final point here before we get to your question is, there's a big concern and we hear you. We've had some closings of businesses in the area, which has people concerned. Figgies, of course, they closed. Shopco, um, Office, uh, Office Max, they closed. So our, there's a concern is, well, what's happening to the city? Well, the city's fine. But let's be honest, 
Who determines what business stays in business? Who determines that? The consumer, yes? So what, what the, the difference is, if we look at a restaurant, how come some restaurants are full? They are full up, you go there and you wait an hour to get a seat, and others you can go right in. Uh, and there are some businesses that are struggling. We are very fortunate here in Marshfield that we have the Marshfield um, Chamber of Commerce and Industry that helps our businesses. And we at the city do everything possible to buy local when we can. Um, but the key thing is with these businesses, you know, none of us know if we go out the door and go down, up and down the, the, the road, downtown or anywhere else, we have no idea how those businesses are doing. But we know this for sure. The business needs customers to survive, which is why I think it's so important that we have Mackie uh, uh, helping us and helping the businesses and helping them thrive. What businesses will tell you is that they can't find employees. This is the pickle that we're in. Businesses will tell you, we can't find employees. And yet, and our, we have record low unemployment. Um, when we've had these businesses that sadly have gone out of businesses, many of those people were scooped up right away with other employers. It's still rough to lose a job. We know that because when you go to your job, that kind of becomes your family. You're there with them a lot. And that is very, very sad. But overall, our economy here in Marshfield is very good. But I believe we can make it better. But here's the key thing, the final thing, and then I'm going to open it up and the rest of it is yours. We need your input. And that is the key thing that we really, really need is the citizen input. When we have these meetings, come voice your opinion. Voice what you think would be good or, or not good. We've had many council meetings, um, some of them spirited, where citizens come in and they voice their complaints or they say, this is really good. We need that because local government should give you what you want. But the only way we can give you what you want is if you tell us, which is why I'm so excited that you were here. So that's all for me. I'll open it up now to questions. If you want you, um, to ask a question just so that everybody can hear it, you can go up here to the podium. If you don't want to go to the podium, we've got a handheld mic and I'm happy to uh, bring it out to you. So, anybody have a question? No questions? Okay, thank you very much for coming. Please, not, Mr. Not Mr. Bucky. Put me up. Um, yeah, the communications, is, as you've all heard from, from our mayor, is very important. And we're going to work alongside a lot of people within this community. It's, it's, it's essential that we hear from you guys, local businesses, to know what you want from us. We want to provide that information. The newsletter that we put out, we want to know what you want. We're doing it for you. What do you want to see on the cable television network? Let us know. That's what we need to know. What do you want on a website? What are you guys looking for when you're going on Facebook? Uh, maybe uh, we're down, going to be going down the road with Twitter down the road, if that's, that is a need from you guys. We want to hear from you. Please call my office. Uh, call the mayor. Call the city administrator. Any of the department heads. Really, any employee. Let us know. They will let us know. I think it's really important. But we will... We'll do the best we can in all the technologies that are out there. We know the technologies are going to change. 5G is coming out. We know mobile is, is definitely the way to go. Uh, but we're not going to forget about the past. It's really important. That's why we're using cable television. So The other, the other thing that's very important to be very specific with your, with your question is we are just now, uh, we, we just got the word today the charter is actually going to be out here um, tomorrow. Now, this has been a project that we've been working on. I believe the city has been working on it for almost a year. Um, and we're finally to that point. Now, once that fiber line is here, then what you're going to find is the audio is going to be much better. The other thing is, um, I believe, especially when you heard the playback, 
when it went to, um, uh, when it was going through YouTube for the meetings. There was a lot of interference there, so it really sounded scratchy. Um, recently now, since we brought it in here, when I was listening the other day, I was watching you and your committee, the sound was substantially better. Um, but we need to get that, and I believe that our, that our um, fiber lines that come in, once that's here and once we actually have all of that transferred here, I believe we'll be in great shape. I will tell you, it's, we've not, it's not been easy to deal with charter. That's the first time I've heard you say my sound was better. But your sound, your sound was better. Yeah, so that, to, it, that, will, that you should see a, a substantial change here in very short order. Mr. Wagner. perception about the, the quality of roads in Marshfield were based simply on North Central Avenue. Uh, one thing that was concerned, I don't know, maybe Dan can answer this more specifically. Um, we took a lot of core samples on our own, and those core samples looked pretty bad from what I remember. Um, the question is, and then of course the state is adamant that they're going to do an overlay. They're going to grind it up and do an overlay. But what happens if the substrate is worse than we than they imagine, and who pays for it? Uh, does, does anybody know how that, uh, or what what provisions are made for that in the contract, or has has any provision made for that in the contract? I can take a stab at that. Um, so the, the construction of the improvement is funded 100% by DOT, except for a small amount of cost sharing for paving of the parking lanes. DOT does not pay for parking improvements, so that is our obligation. In our project agreement with DOT, that's a fixed cost, so that's capped at, at a flat amount. We know already what that amount would be. For. The, the parking lanes. The parking lanes, ca yeah. Capped at a fixed cost. Right, so our, our obligation on that project is capped. So to get to your question about what happens if they find things worse, they, they do have some provision built in for uh, some base patching underneath the asphalt, essentially repairing the, the old concrete underneath. Whether it's enough or not still remains to be seen, of course, but uh, for this project, DOT would cover that cost. Now, once the project is complete, then <coughs> maintenance of that in future years is city responsibility, just as we've seen our, our patching and trying to maintain that road, that will still be our responsibility. So if it does get through the first few years and out into uh, years 8, 9, 10, and we have more patching, then ultimately the city could be on the hook for those things. What DOT has told us is that this is about a 12-year fix on this project. Uh, and after that, then they would look at something more substantial. Uh, we understand that's a strategy they're using all over the state because they can't afford to do what's really needed, and that is a total reconstruction of that project. So it remains to be seen what will happen in 10 or 12 or 15 years if there will really be a, a reconstruct project or, or if that gets pushed further on. They will, they've told us they will monitor it and, and add it into their six-year plan when conditions show that it's, it's necessary. But in, in the short term, uh, for this specific project for this year, our uh, cost uh, obligation is capped. Thank you. Can I ask another question then? Sure, please. Um, one of the things that, that uh, uh, I was very happy to see that was accomplished is the, the update to the housing uh, study came through. Um, I think what that shows, and I, I've looked at it, um, and then if my memory is correct, um, because we do not have expansion room in Marshfield for new single-family housing, or we don't have much of it. We have land, but it, it's, it's not developed for that. Um, basically, the surrounding townships have been getting a free ride because people are building outside of Marshfield and not, not here. Um, I would hope that, uh, I know the Economic Development Board had one uh, one proposal for a city-owned subdivision where the city would provide, would acquire the land and provide the infrastructure and then open it up for all developers to build housing on it. Uh, that got killed pretty badly. That was pretty brutal. Uh, but uh, something like that is going to have to happen if we're going to be able to uh, compete with the townships. So I, I encourage you to, to carry on with that. And with that, uh, I, I think I'll sit down after that, but uh, I, I thank you for having that study completed, and I urge the Economic Development Board to 
implement it as quickly as possible and uh, be bold about it for a change, okay guys? <laughs> okay, thanks. And thank you, Ed, for volunteering to be on the housing committee. I do appreciate that. Um, what's very interesting is Ed brings up a, a very, very good point. The, the, the cost, why are more properties built? I believe right now we have a supply of about 60 lots somewhere in that neighborhood. We're averaging building anywhere from 12 to 15 a year, which means in four years you're out of lots. So, and, and more people want to live here, we need more people to live here to supply our businesses with a great workforce. So we're going to have to do something. Ed brings up a very good uh, point. Several years ago, the city used to put in the infrastructure and then the builders came and, and did whatever. New bu builders want to build in Marshfield. The issue is they can't afford the carrying costs of putting in the infrastructure. If you're going to go put in a 23 or 24 um, subdivision, you're looking at about a million dollars before you even put uh, concrete to build the basement, just your infrastructure. So I believe that we're going to have to do something. We have a, a unique issue here in Marshfield is we try to keep our taxes low. Uh, if you compare us to the big uh, three around us, we're substantially, we're substantially less. That's good. But the other thing is then you run out of money. You can't do anything. We can't have both. If, if we're going to grow, we have to understand that we're going to have to do something. And I believe this study kind of uh, catapults it. And um, Josh, our development services director, has done a great job with this study in, in his department. He's done a lot for the city. And I, I believe that this you will start seeing more and more as the EDB comes to the council with, uh, with different things to do. We need to do something for housing. Just one second. Can we get her? Because that's an excellent point. My neighbors had her house up for sale for a year, but it's only got one bathroom. Nobody wants a one-bathroom house. Um, I live in an older part of town, and there are a number of houses that have been on the market for a long time, and they're basically you know, three-bedroom, one-bathroom houses. Nobody wants to buy them. Well, it's, it's a very interesting dynamic. Uh, what you'll find typically in housing, um, um, and of course, you know, long before I was here in Marshfield, I was in real estate. I will tell you that the number one thing in housing is price. So that is a big consideration um, that we have to do. But the other thing is, you're exactly right. What do people want to buy? You know, the, the housing study shows that we need more affordable housing. Well, for a builder to go out and build, you're looking at $200,000 to build a very basic home. That's not affordable housing. That's, that's a lot of money. So we, we have to find out. But that's going to be very important. What you're bringing up is exactly what we're talking about in the housing committee for the public to come say, what do you want? So that we make sure that if the council makes the decision that uh, they do want to go forward with putting some money in, in a uh, subdivision or whatnot, that it is going to make sense. There's other things that came out in the housing study. For instance, in other areas that may not be kept up as well. Um, putting some money in there, low or no interest rate loans to help people go in and update those homes, which would make them more marketable. So there's a lot that's going to be in that, uh, uh, that committee, I think, is going to be very, very helpful. But it's going to take the public speaking up. Please. Hello, my name is Mike Weinfurtner. I live behind Graham Park. Uh, no, I disagree with... Uh, the uh, cost of uh, housing that uh, as as far as the uh, uh, the taxes go, taxes are are pretty high for this small town. Even though I know the area, that there's some low taxes in uh, other areas, but taxes are high here. And two things with taxes: uh, that uh, when your taxes are high for your housing, uh, then the state the state gets a chance to raise their uh, their uh, Fair market value, they can raise that up. And the fair market value is very high for Marshfield, Wisconsin right now, very high. And uh, when, when they can do that, uh, then when the city of Marshfield has a reassessment, then they can use that as a gauge and as a reference, the state fair market value. They can use that. And then also, 
uh, they can use the, uh, uh, the state aid. If you're getting state aid here for the uh, city of Marshfield, then that's a factor for your, uh, uh, your taxes. Uh, like the mayor mentioned, uh, he was looking for uh, uh, ways to have um, better, uh, uh, better advancement of, uh, excuse me, better advancement of, um, of subdivisions. Well, one way would be to, to have a, 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 a pro-tax on the housing over a period of years after they buy the lot, uh, you know, build the house and then have a pro, a pro tax that way, which would be something that they would have over a, a period of time, but they wouldn't get it all right away. But right now in Marshfield, the taxes are pretty high. I think people want a reduction in taxes. And I just talked to the uh, city assessor, Keith, and uh, recently and this week, and uh, he, uh, he, he don't know why it's high, but it's just that, just that it is. They need to make those changes, and certainly they can look into different ways of doing it because they have the, they have the opportunity to go with cities that are lower and ask them, you know, just uh, copy what other people are doing. Uh, the city of Wisconsin Rapids keeps their taxes low, and they, they use a lot of different uh, incentives and, and uh, different policies to, to do that. So if I can just, which your input is very, very good, and I think we have a second person for the housing committee, so I do appreciate that. But you, you see, you bring up a very good point, but if you look at this, the city of Marshfield tax rate per thousand is $9.29. Wisconsin Rapids is over $12.30. If you look at Wausau, they're higher, they're close to 10. Stevens Point is about 40 cents more. So if you look at that, but, the per, but here's the thing, but your perception is what many people in Marshfield think. But I'm gonna challenge you, and thank you for your input. I'm gonna challenge you to do this. If you live in Wood County, go to the Wood County uh, uh, property, do a property tax search, and you look at the taxes that you've paid over the last five years, you're gonna see what the credits, it's flat. But meanwhile, the city expenses have gone up. It's a very, very, uh, it's a very, very unique thing. So we don't want to we don't want to overtax. It's very important. But here's the other issue that we have. Because there are so many good paying jobs here in Marshfield, um, and how do we know that? Just ask our business owners. They can they cannot get people in, right? Um, because of that, we have fifteen thousand unique people coming into the city every day that live outside. So that's wear and tear on the roads that the people that live here have to pay. Um, so it's, it's very, very important, really, that we understand um, the wear and tear that's there. And so we are, we're certainly sensitive to taxes, very sensitive. But, you know, we're going to be putting in a new aquatic center, um, which I think is going to be very, very beneficial. And that's going to be a great public-private um, a project that we're going to do together. So we really need to look at a way that we can keep taxes reasonable, but at the same time, um, at the same time expand because we can't do both. The other thing that we need to do, a common misconception, and this came out, which is why I'm so happy that Josh did such a great job in the housing study. Many people think that it's, it's cheaper tax-wise to live out in the country. But if you look at what you're paying globally, when you have to pump out those holding tanks and all that, it actually costs you more to live there. Yes, your taxes are less, but that's not the whole picture. This is why for those of us here in the city where you've got uh, running uh, sewer, and it's because of the great uh, uh, Marshfield utilities have done a tremendous job in keeping our utility prices reasonable in our infrastructure. Guys and gals, I gotta tell you this, we are very lucky here in Marshfield because the unsung heroes in the utilities keeping those things down is, is very, very important. But if you just go out and you just take a look on what the taxes are, they're lower in the surrounding cities. People want to live out in the country for two reasons. Now, we can't do anything about one of them. Some people just want to live out in the country in a bigger home. They can have a goat. They can have a chicken. They can have all these things, which is, or they just, 
or they want to be around trees and everything else. We can't do anything about that. But the other thing is, they think it's cheaper. So we, as a city, and all the entities that we work with need to do a much better job of educating people on how much it's really cost. You can't just look at this one fee and think that it's big, especially with a lot of people think it's cheaper in, in Rapids, Stevens Point, uh, and Wausau. But when you look, you do the research, you see we're less expensive than all of them. But here's the thing. Perception is reality. Yes? So this is where we need to do a better job of that. And at the same time, not go excessive. But your point is very, very well taken. And I liked your one idea about the housing, so I hope you'll consider uh, that committee as well. Other questions? We're getting volunteers for committees tonight. I'm gonna, we'll fix it tonight. Sir. Thanks. Continuing on the housing theme, um, the housing study's been excellent and it showed a lot of needs. And I know we're gonna have some, some discussion in the community with the council and economic development over the next few weeks. Am I correct in this understanding? Just, just check me here. The city has a budget and they levy taxes for that. So. And you can only change based on the state law. The levy can only go by up by a small amount each year. So right. you're really limited at the city level as to how much the budget can go up. But if we as taxpayers want to help control our taxes, we want to see the property values in the city go up as rapidly as possible. So as property taxpayers, more development in the city and sub something that helps spur this housing development is good for all of us who want to pay lower taxes or keep taxes where they're at. Do I have that right? Yes. Thank you. So far, you're right on. So let's do, let's do this analysis. If I, um, if you could invest in something and you can invest in $100,000 and in 30 years or 20 years, you'd get paid back 400,000. Would that be a good investment? Reasonable, yes? Imagine this, imagine if we, and I'm not saying we're gonna do this because this has to go through a lot of different things. And ultimately the council needs to make the decision. But let's just look at this. If you put in, for ease of math, I hope somebody has a calculator here that can help me with this one. But if you put in 20 homes, um, let's say in the $300,000 range, property taxes on that, I, this is all an estimate, say $4,000 times 20 is $80,000. Yes? Now, if you do that over 10 years, that's 800000 If you do it over 20, that's $1.6 So if you invested a million, you'd get back out one6 And that's only if you amortize that over 20 years. That's a solid investment. And that is why I believe what the housing study is saying is it makes sense. We're not saying go do this for free or, we're, you know, just go give it. We can't give away the store. We have to be reasonable. But I, be I believe there's opportunities there, but you got to see the big picture, which is why I think it's so important. The, um, oh, I'm so glad I didn't trip because it, um, I, I'm very excited about the meeting that we have coming up with the utility and with the EDV and with Macking, with the Main Street, and all these different, man, if we can get on the right road, and we can listen to the citizens and create that vision for where Marshfield is gonna be in five years, 10 years, 15 years, I believe all these issues will answer themselves, but we all have to be on the same page. I've gotta tell you, I'm very excited about Marshfield, and I think our brightest days are ahead. We have some great things uh, to go, but we just need, we need more education. I, I think that that common misperception of taxes are higher here than in other cities, that's a, that is a true perception. Um, not that they're wrong, that's perception. So we have to work on that. We need to, to better, we need to do a better job of showing that. And I think this study is a good start. I disagree with that housing should be uh, 200, 300,000. Because today, the millennials, 
what they want is low cost housing so they can afford it even if the husband and wife both have a good job they want low cost that's what they're looking for and that's what they're looking for in old housing and you said it yourself there wasn't many old houses available and that's what they're really looking for is that low cost housing something that is not just affordable as low cost but something that's manageable so sure. they can manage their finances and they can manage their life you their are, lifestyle you are 100% accurate and here's the thing with that when i said 200,000 before or 300,000 that was an analogy to how it would work because if you would put the infrastructure in in that price range that you're speaking of the math would still remain the same so i'm not saying that we need to go to a certain price point or anything like that very good point other questions please um, Tim Johnson over in 703 North Palmetto. BJ. How you doing? I'm very good. How are you? Thank you. So you had a few slides up there, and some of them were very key about the communications with other cities. And we also had some slides about we only got like 20 lots or 40 lots or whatever to expand in Marshfield for building. What we didn't see was your plan to communicate with the townships. Because McMillan, Cameron, and you even got, and it was even mentioned before, that they are actually benefiting from being outside of this area at a lower cost, but then Marshfield is the one that's paying for all the transportation, things like that. What is the plan to communicate with those townships and even possibility looking at bringing those in as subdivisions versus townships? Oh, great question. Mr. Penker has got to love that question. Um, here's the issue. First of all, this is why we have put together this, this incredible communication committee. Now, this communication committee is not limited to the seven people that I believe that are gonna be on it. We need to do that. When we were looking at, when the, when the communication committee got together, Mr. Butkey uh, and some others were here, Mr. Pinker was there. Mr. Pinker actually brought up, Mr. Pinker actually brought up, when you saw branding, that's straight from him. Um, but the other issue is not only do we need to communicate just here in Marshfield, but to the outskirts of Marshfield in the, in the, in the, in the areas that you're talking about and actually in central Wisconsin whole Wisconsin and actually it gets much bigger than that that is exactly what we have to do and we are we are going to be relying heavily on our communication department is going to take care of the day-to-day -day, let's do this let's do that let's get the newsletter out that newsletter is awesome um, they're going to take care of that but the communication committee is going to come up with the different ideas that you're talking about, come up with the concept, how it will be executed, and then once that's there, turn it over to execute that plan. It is crucial what you're talking about. I'm very happy you're on that committee. He is. Please. Yeah, you know, uh, carrying on with that theme, there, there are some formal structures for that that, that have been uh, forged out by statute and over the years. Uh, there, there is uh, right now a joint, uh, a Marshfield McMillan joint boundary committee uh, that deals with a lot of things. There was one with Cameron, but Cameron a few years ago decided they didn't like us very much and they, they uh, sort of, they didn't renew the contract. But I don't think there's ever been one with Lincoln and I don't think there's ever been one with the town of Marshfield. Uh, so, Your Honor, I think that's uh, your uh, bailiwick, sir. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you, those are, I think, I think opening up those lines of communications are important. Um, I don't think there's much left of the town of Cameron, but uh, uh, I, but we do need to open up communication to the men because there's a lot going on down on that south side. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Other questions, Mr. Pinker. I just want to uh, perhaps change the wording that the mayor's been using. For too many years, the thinking in Marshfield has been one directional or one dimensional. And the thinking that we need in the 21st century has got to be multidimensional. Uh, Mayor and I had a conversation last week about that same topic. We can't think in the concept of a line. We, you know, if you're thinking in the case of a line, it's basically you can stand there and you'll throw a stone and it goes one direction. We've got to be standing there and have a handful of material so we're striking as many items as we can possibly do. Development is not going to occur in a one-dimensional context. Uh, and the mayor was talking about reality versus perception. Uh, 
when you look at our downtown, we have some people who believe this is the best thing since sliced bread, that the revised Central Avenue to 89 years ago and everything is super duper down there now. But yet you take a look at downtown, it appears at least twice every night on the news through the uh, city hall cam, what vision does the surrounding area get about Marshfield? On one TV station, you get this long airport runway, which we call downtown Central Avenue. And from the other TV station, you get the uh, roof of the library and the roof of Quick Trip. We're not portraying the city in a good positive light, and this is where a new idea of branding and imaging and communication has to take place. It, you know, very good points, and the issue is, I think what we all have to be aware of, guys and gals, change is hard. Would you all agree with that? People don't like to change, and yet we change every day. For those of you that have cell phones, we can do everything. I have more power in my cell phone than I, the computer I had 10 years ago. Everything is changing, and that is uncomfortable for many, but that's, that's part of the vision is I believe Mr. Pinker is right. We just can't stay static. We have to look forward. Uh, so that we could progress in, in getting the communication out. I think it's very, very important. I believe that's how we're going to do it, is to communicate. But we need your input, which when I say your, I'm, I'm just talking about the, you know, the, 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 the citizens. I'm very happy you're here. I'm very honored that you would take you know, an hour out of your night to come down and talk about this. But we need, we need a lot more input so we know that what we're doing is, is the right thing. Very important. Please, he'll be right there. You said something very important, uh, perception is reality. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm a newcomer to Marshfield. I've only been here 30 years. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I've seen, um, I moved into an old neighborhood. Um, and so, and most of my, the neighbors that I first knew are, are gone. But there is a perception of, division in Marshfield. There is a perception, I mean, we had a neighbor that uh, basically had little uh, uh, talk sessions on his front porch for years. And they believed that the clinic, the entity of the clinic was somehow opposed to the interests of the ordinary person that the interests of the university was somehow opposed to the interest of the ordinary person, of the long-term, lifelong resident of Marshfield. My landlord, when I first moved here, basically said that, well, if you go to the clinic, don't tell them that you're from Marshfield, because if you come in as a referral from somewhere else, you'll get better treatment. I, perception, not reality, you know, but you said it, perception is reality. That was a perception. There is that perception of division in Marshfield that is something that needs to be overcome so that you can, we can go in a single direction, a, as a unified direction. You know, I, I, think you've got, I think you have a great point. And, and we really can only do so much. We're going to try to do a lot better communication and everything else. But the perception is many times what happens is, and if you all go on Facebook, what you find is, um, people tend to go towards people that agree with them. And so the only way where we can really come along is for those people that have that perception. For instance, you bring up uh, the university system, which we're very happy with the university system. I don't know if you saw at the last council meeting, but they're bringing more four-year degrees right here in Marshfield. And that is tremendous um, in, in, uh, in health care. Um, and in mental, uh, mental health, and they're also looking into, uh, Alderman Witzel brought this up, we are, you know, we're education town. Our school system is one of the best in the state, I mean, the, w which helps us attract, but what we have to understand, what I would say to somebody th that had that perception, I'm not going to say it's wrong, if that's their perception, go to the university and volunteer and see if that is the case. We need more people, guys and gals, to get involved. The only way we're going to change perception is if we go give our input. That's how you change perception. But, you know, people have, believe me, in the short time that I've been mayor, there has been 
I've heard different things about the clinic. Let me tell you something. It's an award-winning. It's an award-winning facility. Um, we have healthcare right here. Many people come into Marshfield uh, from other from other states to get the healthcare here. So we're very helpful. We're very happy to have them here. But your your point is very well made. That is the perceptions, and I'm just going to ask people to be open-minded and go seek out go seek out the answer. Go seek out how we can how we can change that, because I think it would be very very helpful. Many, if you go, if you know, one thing that you find is around the city, there's a lot of coffee clutches. Mr. Butkey, if you'd like to see him, go to McDonald's. Uh, he's got a seven o'clock clutch, an eight o'clock, and a nine o'clock. The first one, I believe, we talk politics and it's sports at nine o'clock, so don't come at the wrong time. <laughs> um, and what you find is different coffee. And uh, Mr. Ebro, of course, he's in a coffee clutch uh, at the Daily Grind. What you'll find is those clutches are great, it's communication, but they kind of come up with their own conclusion, if you will. And so we, we can use that, but your point is if well I taken. Could expand on that. Please. But I have to expand on that a little bit. Uh, Mayor Norberg, he said he went to coffee shops when he was mayor and uh, he always said, I put out more fires and more misstatements. And that's what I find, too. Uh, I always say there's two kinds of people. There's, there's certainly people that will hear stuff that could be wrong, and I'm able to explain to them what it is. Oh, I didn't know that. And, and most of the time, they come around. There's the other kind, there, unfortunately, that you can't do a darn thing with. You know, they, they just prefer to be negative. But uh, you get to, communication is good. And even though I really enjoy myself at the coffee shops and, and we solve all the world problems right there. So if anybody wants to stop in, and we're always right after the fact. So, uh, but it, it is, you, you can put out a lot of misconceptions and, and ideas. You educate people. And I do know that there's another alderman, uh, Mike Fire. I believe he's, he's out in California right now. Yeah. He's at the Legion, and um, he's there all the time. And it's good, it's good when the aldermen are out in the public as well as I go to as many public things um, that I possibly can. Um, I've even had people, when we're going down the, the meat aisle down at festival, people want to talk then, which is fine. When you, when you run for office, you expect that type of thing. But the more we can do, the more conversations we can have, the better off we are. Please. Um, perceptions again. I've been, I'm a short timer here too. I've only been here 28 years. So I'm a you know, new, newcomer. Um, one of the things that um, we perceive is that we got an awful lot of melons in town. Not melons, uh, um, that's the word I want. <laughs> lemons, lemons. Well, I've always had the uh, perspective is we got a lot of lemons, let's make a lot of lemonade, okay? We got, uh, we're in the middle of the state. Why don't we make better use of that? We have a four-lane highway that ends here. Why not expand it? Um, back when I worked here, I always made the argument, Interstate 96, it goes from Michigan to Michigan. That's not an interstate. Why not pick it up in Manitowoc, run through Marshfield to 94, and then up to uh, Superior as Interstate 96? That's going to help us if we do things like that. There's lots of other uh, lemons that are perceived lemons that could be lemonade here. Um, we got the clinic. We got the, <coughs> the, the education system. OK, how do we make those lemons into lemonade? Uh, you know what, it, it, you bring up a great point, and I think that is more communication. You know, I, I, it's interesting, we have an award-winning school right here. Number, uh, I believe, number two or three in the state. Phenomenal educators right here. We need more publicity, but let's all be very, very clear. Negativity sells a lot more than positivity. It just does. So we, but we still need to do a better thing. But I love your ideas about bringing it up, and that's those are the types of ideas um, that, that really will help us grow. Okay, sir. I just want to uh, expand on what you said there. 
about bringing perception into reality, where perception meets reality, and then reality goes into a mindset. And when you get the mindset, then you got people coming your way, providing they all got the same mindset. Well, uh, I've been in charity for many, many years, and uh, uh, there's a lot of different diverse people in charity. And that would be one big thing to bring Marshfield together. She talked about division in Marshfield, and I think that would bring division together is charity work. Now, the government has a, the federal government has a tracking agency. They track charity, they track community service work, and they, uh, uh, they track volunteerism. And they, they watch that pretty closely. The federal government agency does. And this is a big thing. If it's big enough for the federal government to do, then it's big enough for uh, the local governments to have too. And uh, I think that would be a big issue to bring it together. How you would bring that together, well, that would take some leaders and good example. A uh, good example to exemplify this whole thing and, and bring it together. Yes, it would be a big job. Can it be done? Yes. Uh, because uh, the charity capital of the U.S. used to be Denver, Colorado, before the Columbine, before the Columbine shootings. And why couldn't Marshfield uh, uh, take a lesson from them and try to learn and uh, develop that also? And that would bring your uh, uh, divisiveness and your uh, division, uh, you know, uh, together and less, uh, 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 less divided. Okay, thank you. You know, it, it, it's a great point. One thing we know about the citizens of Marshfield is they're very gracious and they're very giving. When we've uh, done the uh, Wenzel Family Plaza was a great public-private um, entity. The, we have the pool coming up and there's many people that love Marshfield um, and they contribute and they do that. They give of that. And you're going to see a, a fundraising committee come on. I, I believe that, uh, uh, very excited about this meeting towards the end of the month. Um, because I really believe that we're going to see some great things happening because the people get involved. The leaders have to come up with it and need to be on the same page. But here's the thing. We want to lead with what you want. And that's what's so important. Because maybe what we think would be good isn't what you want. And so real, who has the real leadership here in the city or the citizens? You, the citizens determine what businesses do well and what businesses don't by their checkbook, when, when they go right, when they, when they go to the downtown businesses. But let's understand this. The world has changed. Um, Amazon and companies like that, it is a different world. It's hurt all those retailers. Um, and so um, how do we help our local businesses is buy local as much as you possibly can. Uh, it's very important. But um, your ideas tonight have been uh, phenomenal. This is all recorded, so we're going to put as many of these to use as we possibly can. Any, uh, any further questions? Please. You've been talking uh, about perception, and I will point a finger at my three friends here, aldermen. Uh, two th they did not mention that in 2005, the city had contracted with the University of Wisconsin at Eau Claire to produce a public attitude public perception study. That's 2005. That's more than a few years ago. It might be time to look at that again because it gave us some excellent results as to what the public was thinking about services, departments, and the community. Absolutely. Very good. Any further questions? You talked about um, the supporting the local businesses, I agree with that. Um, it, two things. Um, I think that we, in Marshfield, we're doing a good job of doing that with, say, Yonkers and Shopko, but we can't do anything about the corporations right. that pull those out. And second part is, um, what does the future look like for some of those kinds of stores to be restored here? What, is, what does it look like in the future? Is there something coming? that uh, is coming into our area, the, a new mall with new businesses, new stores. Um, what does it look like? There, is, there, there are things being worked on. Um, the mall development there, uh, Ned Brickman is, is going to be coming back. If, if there's, hopefully, there's going to be some new retailers put in. 
But you bring up a very, very good point. You know, there's two aspects to a business staying in business. Number one is that we go support it. But the other issue is their upstairs management needs to run it properly because some of these businesses were really, um, they did a lot of sales and everything, but the upstairs management didn't run it properly. And so the people that are hurt are, of course, the employees. So we have to do, but I really don't know what we can do about that. I will tell you that Mackey, uh, Marshfield Area Chamber of Commerce and Industry, does a lot for our local businesses and helping them uh, uh, get better. But the other thing is we as citizens can, you know, if you have an issue with, with your local retailer, go tell them what you'd like to see. Maybe you'd like to see longer hours or, or whatever, but we do, we do have that control. Please, Scott. Um, just take an opportunity to address some of the questions as it related to the retail and, and what's happening here. What, what can we look forward to? Uh, first, a couple of stats. Um, there's a national study out uh, for 2019. Uh, they're projecting almost 5,000 store closures nationally. The new store openings are only about 2,600. So you can see right there that the prospects of a lot of new stores opening is, is not, not that great. The other aspect, I just heard a report today, uh, online shopping has now surpassed in-store shopping. So for the first time ever, there is more purchasing being done online than physically walking into stores. Now, does that mean that brick and mortar stores are dead, gone forever? No. Um, one of the things that we do through the chamber is, and a staff member was just at a at an international shopping um, conference down in Milwaukee, and I'm waiting to get an update from her. But the reason we go down to that is to get stay, try and stay on top of what the trends are as it relates to um, major retail. Typically, what's going on with major retail is that they're looking at smaller footprints. The brick and mortar is still attractive to them, but in a much smaller uh, footprint, a much less expensive footprint. Um, think of it as a means of that brick and mortar is an opportunity so people can do online shopping with them. You can order your product, you can have it delivered to the store, pick it up, there's no shipping charges. You can take it back to the store. So those are more of what we're probably going to be looking at and what our opportunities are going to be here in Marshfield. And so um, I know there's going to be a lot of discussion going on about what do we do now with the properties, the Office Max properties, the Shopco Plaza properties, once they become um, uh, vacant from the from the stores themselves, and so part of what we do through the chamber, working with our economic partners like the city, is try and make sure that that information is known to uh, national, regional developers, so that that property is on the forefront of thoughts of future development taking place. So I wish I could say we immediately have some things lined up. We don't, but you just know that we'll be working with the realtors, we'll be working with the city to try and make sure that we, we make sure those properties are, are looked at and are thought of as being valuable and trying to address that however we best we can. Boards were back, in fact, 50 years ago, you had a small place, you went, you ordered from the catalog and then you went and picked it up, but it wasn't very big stores, you know, just little ones, and it's coming back to that. <laughs> Absolutely. Right, right. And that's not to say that those properties won't be redeveloped into something else, a, a, a different, better use. Yep. Any further questions? Nope. All right. Uh, uh, so, again, I'd like to thank uh, the alderman and the, the uh, well, the alderman, right? You got voted in. So we're, what's that? Alderman elect. That's right. You're going to get sworn in. Um, and all I'm going to say with that is it's good you will be over here on this side, because if you're next to this one, um, you have issues, right? Um, what's that? You, you've, been, you've been warned. Uh, many of you that have uh, volunteered for uh, committees and stuff, thank you very much. Ed, thank you very much. It's an honor that, uh, that you're here. Ed has, uh, Ed has been a mayor. He's, uh, his political uh, uh, resume is really unbelievable. So thank you so much for coming. If you have any questions, always feel free to uh, call me or email me. But thank you very much for coming.